Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to continue our conversation with Dr. Matthew Bowman. He's the Mormon Studies Chair at Claremont Graduate University, and we're going to talk about why academics don't like to use the word cult. He also says brainwashing doesn't really exist. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. <laughs> so there, are, there aren't any real ties to Mormonism in there? The, no Mormons get book. abducted or... Uh... Oh, there certainly are stories of that sort of thing, um, but not in my book. My book is not about Mormons. It's okay. about the UFO. Well, it's really about the very first alien abduction story in the United States. Do we get into crop circles or mutilated cows or anything? Later on. Um, <laughs> that's really, crop circles and mutilated cows are really um, 70s and 80s phenomenon. So I'm, I'm looking at this couple named Betty and Barney Hill. Um, who said they were abducted by Elaine's in 1961. And they, their story sets the archetype that gets repeated by many other people who say they were abducted, gets repeated by the X-Files, gets repeated by all sorts of movies, right? The story being that these uh, this craft appeared, small creatures came out of the craft. What did they look like? They are small. They have big heads. They have slanted black eyes. That kind of you know quintessential depiction of the alien, that's from Betty and Barney Hill. And we were taken aboard the craft, we were medically experimented on, um, and then we were dumped back by the side of the road, and we forgot all about it. Until we had, then Betty has nightmares, they see a hypnotist, um, the hypnotist um, puts them under, and under um, hypnosis they recover all these memories. That fundamental story, right, becomes the archetype for nearly every UFO abduction story since. Um, almost every UFO abduction since Betty and Barney Hill, since their story became famous, um, which it became in the 1960s, there was a best-selling book written about them. And then about 10 years after the book, James Earl Jones made a movie about this, and he stars as Barney Hill in the movie. And you know, so the, the book and the movie between them really kind of embed this story in American consciousness, and it just gets repeated over and over. And you know, part of the story also is how Betty and Barney Hill initially, they trusted government, they trusted experts, they went to scientists, they went to the military, they went to all these people, and they expected to be believed. Um, and they find that over and over again, even their their hypnotist, who's a, who is a psychiatrist, tells them, I don't think this really happened. Um, the military just says, thanks for telling us, and doesn't doesn't follow up at all. Um, they they end up turning to the to New Age people. Um, and they get who believe them? In the new way. Yeah, and who believe? And not only believe them, but also tell them, yeah, you had this experience, but here's how your experience connects to all these other stories, right? It's not just an isolated thing. Um, it 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 helps us understand this sort of like how the world really works. And by the 1970s, of course, you have the rise of conspiracy theory. Um, that trust in government that's present in the 50s and early 60s has vanished by the 70s because of Watergate, because of Vietnam. Um, there was a famous, now forgotten, series of Senate hearings chaired by Senator Frank Church. It's called the Church Committee. Um, and they discover that the CIA had has been involved in assassination attempts on foreign leaders that Americans were never told about. You know, and this whole sort of sense that there is a, a kind of shadowy conspiratorial world really running things. A deep state? Perhaps. Um, that appears. And, of course, UFO folklore. By the 80s, UFO stories are really, really deeply bound into the sense that the government is lying to us, and you can't trust anybody. Right? Well, and you talked about these kind of mostly benevolent uh, aliens, but there is another strain where, you know, you've got War of the Worlds, H.G. Yeah. Wells, they're here yeah. to invade mm -hmm. the Earth. I mean, that's from the 30s, if I remember yeah, right. Yeah, well, even earlier, even earlier. The, there was the movie V, these lizard mm -hmm. people are coming yes. to take over and <laughs> suck all the life out of humans. Yeah. Can you talk about, because those are, those are definitely not benevolent. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, that, you know, so you do have early on in the 20th century, um, you have this sense, with War of the Worlds particularly, right, this sort of basic story of aliens are frightening and hostile. Then in the 1950s, there is this whole spate of people who call themselves contactees. I um, mean, the most famous of them is a guy named George Adamski. And Adamski says, um, he lives in Southern California, um, and he is plugged into the very early stirrings of what would become the New Age movement eventually. And he's descended from, there's a 19th century movement called Theosophy, 
um, that is very interested in ancient religions and theosophists believe that there is a hierarchy of beings in the universe and they want to help us. They want to help human beings progress. They're called the ascended masters and they, um, Jesus was one, Buddha was one, Socrates was one, right? And they, they want to help us, us progress. Um, Adamski and these other contactees are plugged into that. And when Adamski meets aliens, they are tall, blonde Aryans. Oh. Yeah. And they are benevolent. They want to help us. Are they us. German too? I mean, you know, there certainly is some of that, right? <laughs> um, there's, uh, theosophy is deeply racialized, right? Oh, wow. and, and theosophists tend to believe, they actually use the term Aryan in the 19th century, right? That there, that there is a hierarchy of existence that humanity is part of, and that hierarchy even goes into humanity itself. Um, but the, Adamski's only one. There's a dozen other of these people in the 50s who say that the aliens are benevolent. They want to help us. They look like us. They look like kind of archetypical white people, right? And they're here to help us progress. The Hills, their story just destroys that, um, right? Because for them, aliens don't look like us. They are frightening and strange. And the fact that the Hills story becomes so popular, I think, really embeds this image of aliens as threatening um, in the American consciousness. Now, the, those older theosophists and their, bl their blonde aliens, right, they stick around. They, they pop back up in the 70s when a lot of these New Age people um, are talking about progression um, and being aided by higher powers and that sort of thing, right? Um, those, uh, they're called the Venusians because George Adamski said they're from Venus. So, And you will have then by the 90s, by the 70s, 70s 80s, and 90s, different UFO people talking about different races of aliens and saying, yeah, there are the Venusians and they're the nice ones. They want to help us. But then there's also the greys, right? The greys are these little guys with big heads who are maybe threatening, who are hostile. There's also a group of reptilian aliens. Um, there's a, a, another species called the mantis men who look like humanoid praying mantises who are also very threatening. And so if you go into the your UFO subculture, you will encounter by the by the 80s and 90s, there's this whole panoply of different sorts of species. Do, do you get in? Because there was that guy, I want to say his name was Applewhite. Oh, they did yeah. a mass Heaven's suicide. Gate. Heaven's, Heaven's Gate. Gate, right. Yeah. And they did a mass suicide, mm -hmm. I think, in San Diego because they were waiting to yes. for the aliens to come save them or something? Yeah, absolutely. Is that in your book as well? Um, no. No? But, but I taught a book about them last semester, so I can talk oh, okay. about Heaven's Gate. Yeah. This is a book called Heaven's Gate, America's UFO Religion by a friend of mine named Benjamin Ziller. It's a really excellent book. And he traces, right, how what Heaven's Gate is doing, what Marshall Applewhite, um, the leader of Heaven's Gate, is doing is stitching together some of what George Adamski and the contactees are doing, right, this idea of benevolent aliens who want to help us. He's weaving that together with Pentecostal Christianity and dispensationalist Christianity, hmm. right, which is... Dispensationalism, right, is this, um, as it's usually used in America today, is this belief that you'll find among evangelical and charismatic Christians. Some of it has steeped into um, the LDS Church as well, that the second coming is going to be preceded by this long stretch of essentially disasters. And if we read the Bible really carefully, we can stitch together the narrative. And so we'll know that the Antichrist is going to emerge here, and then there's going to be a war over here, and then there'll be uh, you know, a, a massive floods and earthquakes and catastrophes, right? This stuff is really popular. And you know, there's, there's novels about this. Even within the LDS Church, there's a whole lot of, um, of books from people who say they saw visions of how this coming is going to happen. This almost sounds like Chad Daybell and Maury Yeah, Bobo it absolutely is. It yeah. absolutely is. They're, they're dispensationalists in their thinking. Um, but that emerges, that kind of dispensationalism emerges in the late 19th and early 20th century. And Marshall Applewhite was very influenced by it when he was a young man. So he's taking some of that dispensationalism, the sense, right, that, that history is winding up, that there's going to be all these catastrophes and disasters. He's tying that in with this kind of contactee UFO idea and saying there will be disasters on Earth, but the benevolent aliens are going to come and save some of us. Hmm. Um, and so he, he melds these two religious strains, right, to create his own. This kind of religious creativity is, is also, I think, I would argue, this is very much a function of how religion works in the West after the decline of these large institutional religions. 
Because one thing, large religious institutions, denominations, right, the Roman Catholic Church, um, the Southern Baptist Convention, even the LDS Church, one thing they're gen- they, they generally were good at in their heyday, and the heyday of this sort of denominational religion is really the late 17th century through the mid-20th century, was kind of imposing regularity, right, and saying, like, this is what Presbyterians believe, and this is what Baptists believe. Right? And you would have people, visionaries like Joseph Smith and other new religious leaders, emerging on the fringes of these old denominations and kind of doing their own thing and, and exhibiting religious creativity. But by and large, the main center of American religion was these big denominations. Um, as those denominations begin declining, which they begin to do in the 1960s, you would see more and more people like Marshall Applewhite right? Um, these kind of r- religious innovators who would piece together traditions and pieces of many different traditions and create these new religious movements. And that's, I think, really what the religious landscape of America is in- looking like more and more today. Religion isn't declining in America, right? It's just becoming increasingly fragmented and diverse, and people are being incredibly creative and, and doing all sorts of different things and stitching together pieces of many different religious practices. Hmm. <laughs> Well, so the rise of the nuns, basically, if I'm understanding you right, are you saying it's not that they don't believe in religion, but they're moving into new age and astrology and that That's sort of exactly thing? That's exactly right. Yeah, if you, if you dig into the survey data among the nuns, you will find that the, ma- the vast majority, not all of them, but the vast majority of them will say they still they believe in higher power. They believe in religious practice. They're not atheists. Atheists remain a very, very small. So it's not the rise of the atheists. No, it's <laughs> the rise of the nuns, right? And when they say nun, what the, you know that word, right? It, mm-hmm. We call them that because what they if they, you ask them what religion are you, they will say nun. And what they mean by that is they will say I'm not a Presbyterian. I'm not a Baptist. I'm not a Roman Catholic. But that doesn't mean they're, they don't believe in stuff and they're not doing stuff. They are. They are doing things. They do believe in things. It's just not guided by these large central religious institutions. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Um, last week when we were talking, we had a conversation about high demand religion versus the term cult. I know some people like to use those interchangeably. Um, (laughs) Help us recreate that conversation. And why why is it that most academics don't like to use the word cult? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, The word cult, um, when you say that to someone who studies religion professionally and academic studies religion, they will usually just cringe. Um, well, would they do that even with a Marshall Applewhite, yes, a Jim absolutely. Jones? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, those are two mass yeah. murderers, especially. Yeah. yeah. Well, but we, and, we, you still don't like to use the no, word cult with those. No. Here is why. Um, and I, and I, I should, I will give people a little bit of background here. Um, the scholars I am drawing on for this conversation are Go- Gordon Melton, who was kind of the pioneer in studying new religious movements in the United States, um, and also a guy named Hugh Urban, who's written a really, really intelligent book on Scientology, um, which is another one, right? That yeah, another one people like to call a cult. cult. Yeah. For. Um, <clears throat> there's two ways to approach the problem with the word cult. Um, I'll do kind of the historical genealogy of it first, then I'll talk a little bit about definitions. So the word cult emerges... Um, from an ancient term, cultus, which simply means, it's Latin word, and it simply means um, like religious ritual or practice, like what you actually do with your body, right? Going to church is cultus. Um, In the Elder tradition, taking the sacrament is cultus, right? It's something you do, not necessarily something you believe or a community you belong to. It began to be used as cult um, by really early scholars of religion in the 19th century, um, people like James Fraser, um, who would use the word cult to describe behaviors. And they particularly would apply it to groups that they saw as primitive. 
Um, so you will read, if you read The Golden Bow, which is a kind of famous 19th century study of religion, you will see them talking about kind of like the cult of Dionysus in ancient Greece. Um, and what they meant by that was when people would gather to worship Dionysus or interact with Dionysus, that sort of thing. Um, so it was almost always used to apply in application to non-white, non-Christian people. And, and, and this is, seems to have been maybe unconscious on the part of these early, late 19th century, early 20th century scholars. They weren't consciously making that distinction. But it was very clear that what they thought was what we do is religion. What these primitive people of color do is cult. Right? Oh, so color, that's yeah, interesting. And it, it is accurate, right? Because they were describing Africans, they're describing um, South Asians, they're describing indigenous peoples. Well, Dionysus, those are Greeks. Would they, they be Greeks. considered people of color as well? No, they, they would not have been, right? Um, but they are an ancient society. They are not an advanced, civilized society like us. So they would use this word to describe ancient cultures and then also contemporary cultures that they were studying. So they would go, you know, these scholars, they'd, they'd trek into Africa and, and study tribes in Africa. They'd say, oh, they have a fascinating cult in which they do this and that and the other thing, right? And they were using the term to distinguish between religion, which is a word that they often use to describe modern, advanced traditions like Protestantism, which most of them were, right? We do religion, primitive peoples like the ancient Greeks, like the ancient Babylonians, like modern African tribes people, they do cult. Okay. Right? So the term then gets picked up in the early 20th century by evangelical Christians. Hmm. And evangelical Christians start using the word cult to describe, and this is a kind of evangelical theological definition of it, to describe um, perversions of true Christianity. And of course, for them, true Christianity is, again, Protestant Christianity, right? And so... Because they even apply it to Catholics sometimes. Yes, I've do. seen books that say mm -hmm. the Catholic cult. Yeah. There is a famous book um, by an evangelical scholar, I believe his name is Anthony Heckema, called The Four Major Cults, right? And what he means by that is Jehovah's Witnesses. He means Mormons mm -hmm. as well. Um, and then Seventh Day Adventists, and I forget, uh, and I forget. Oh, Christian Science was the last one. So not Catholics. He doesn't he, he call Catholic a major called them, but many others do. Right. Certainly. Then you see in the fifties this famous book by Walter Martin called The Kingdom of the Cults. Yes. And right, and in that he describes Mormons there again as well. Right. right. And and what they mean then, what these evangelicals mean is a cult is a religion that's pretending to be Christian but isn't. Mm -hmm. So then what happens? They worship the wrong Jesus. Right. Then, in the 1960s, I mentioned this earlier, in the 1960s, Congress changes immigration laws, the Hart-Seller Act, and allows many more people from Asia to come to the United States. And you see then, in the mid-60s, the explosion of Asian traditions in the United States. Um, Transcendental Meditation um, is a famous one. But there are others, right? The Hare Krishnas, um, ISKCON, um, a lot of these Asian groups and all these like white Protestants see this, and they're thinking, "Oh, well, these are cults, right? They're they're primitive people of color religions, right?" And so the word "cult" starts to get used in the late sixties and seventies by two groups particularly. The first is um, what evangelicals call their counter cult movement, and this is evangelicals saying, "Oh no, we have to save our kids from joining." these weird, often non-white religious traditions, and they call them cults. Um, the second group are um, not evangelicals. They are secular, and they're mostly centered around people who call themselves deprogrammers, and who draw on the language of psychology and psychiatry, and they say, why would anyone join a primitive religion? It's because they're messed up in the head, and I can save your kid if your kid join, you know, becomes a Hare Krishna. I can save your kid by deprogramming him, by putting him in a hotel room and yelling at him for a while, which happens, <laughs> right? These deprogrammers say, well, I will kid, I, they literally go out and kidnap young people and take them in hotel rooms and berate them until they say they, they will leave whatever Asian tradition they joined. So it's um, almost a form of torture, it sounds like, at least psychological. Yeah. And so what you see then, what you see then emerging from both of these groups 
both the, the, the anti-cult psychiatrist people and the counter-cult evangelicals, is they start talking about definitions of cults, quote-unquote. And they start coming up with a lot of, like, a lot of, I mean, really kind of ad hoc definitions. Like, cults have charismatic leaders, right? Cults make you wear funny clothes. Cults take you away from your families. And if you think about this, all these definitions are is simply saying these are ways in which this religious tradition is not like Protestantism. Um, yeah. And for evangelicals, that's quite overt, right? They basically make lists describing the ways in which Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons um, or practitioners of transcendental meditation or the Unification Church, which is a, a charismatic um, Korean ch Christian church. Yeah, Sun Young Moon. Mm -hmm, exactly. But the ways are not like Protestantism. And their definitions are always that. And, and even the anti-cult, the psychiatrists, the secular people adopt that too because America is so overwhelmingly a Protestant country that Americans tend to think Protestantism is normal religion. And things that don't do Protestantism, those are abnormal, weird religions. Those are cults. Um, and there's a long process in American history in which um, American culture, even the state sometimes, makes other religions become basically Protestant. That's essentially the story of what happened to the LDS church in the late 19th century. Um, all the non-Protestantism was beaten out of the church, and it became essentially just another Protestant church with, with chapels and no more polygamy and capitalism and all the other stuff that Protestant churches have in America. So um, the LDS church has been Protestantized? Oh, yeah, in, a, in many, many ways, yes. Um, so all this is to say then, um, when you look at these definitions of cult, when you ask people to define cults, nearly all the time they will give you a list of ways in which cults aren't Protestant. A um, couple more points on that then. Um, the first is, if you think about it, using these definitions, um, Roman Catholicism is a cult, uh, right? Um, even you could say like, you know, being a fan of the Green Bay Packers is a cult. <laughs> the cult of Donald Trump? Yeah, yeah, right? And the term gets used very frequently and, and really sloppily. Um, there's a, a scholar of religion who says that essentially the rule of thumb is a cult is a religion I don't like. You know, which is, I think, a really apt way to do it. Well, and I, I'm um, glad you mentioned sports. I'm a huge sports fan. Sure, yeah. And you look at the fanaticism of and, some And there's fans. another word, right? What's fanaticism? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> yeah, what is fanaticism, right? Well, it's a fan who goes crazy about their team, right? Okay. Is it, am I giving it the right answer? Is, it, is that right? <laughs> I don't know, right? And I think, again, often fanaticism is applied to things that I'm uncomfortable with, not things I do. Well, and right? I just watched on <laughs> Netflix, there's yeah. the it's a thing called Malice at the Palace. Where oh, yeah. The Pistons yeah. and the Pacers. Test went up into the stands. Oh, and it's, it's a people. riot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's like the perfect example mm -hmm. of fans gone wrong. Okay, and this is an this is I'm glad you brought this up, right? Because often when I will say this, when I will give this explanation and tell people, don't use the word cult, because the word cult, like it, its origins and it, its fundamental meaning, are essentially racist and evangelical, right? And and it just kind of boggles my mind to how all these people who will say, well, I'm not racist, I'm anti-racist, but then they'll still kind of throw around this word cult, right? Which has its roots in essentially kind of um, white Europeans saying people who aren't white Protestants are inferior and less advanced and they do weird things and we don't want to be like them. Um, what they'll often say is, but we, but, but when we use the word cult, we mean to describe a bad, someone bad, right? Like Jim Jones, right? right? Someone who becomes sort of abusive and manipulative and all of this other stuff. Um, they'll also use the word brainwashing. And as a, as a tangent, brainwashing doesn't exist. Um, Academics, psychiatrists, they will tell you, you know, brainwashing is an invention. Um, the term was coined by a journalist named Edward Hunter in the 1950s to describe what, again, and here's the thing, right? Edward Hunter used the term to describe what he said the red Chinese, quote unquote, were doing to American POWs in the Korean War. And he's saying, like, look, these Chinese communists who have a uniform society, all those Chinese people are exactly the same. They are forcing Americans, they're brainwashing Americans into becoming like them. Well, so the word brainwashing me. is a term, right, again, I think, essentially racist in its origins. Um, and we use it, we use the term brainwashing to say 
this person is doing something I wouldn't do, and I can't understand why they're doing it. Well, let me let's go deeper on that because yeah. there's a, the famous Patty Hearst kidnapping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She gets kidnapped by the Symbian Lebanese Symbian's Liberation Army. Donald which DeFries is just a and the makeup Symbianese. thing. Um, I mean, it's it's one of these like seventies like radical groups like we're going to overthrow capitalism and all yeah. of that kind of stuff. But but the idea here is she's like, well, who's the big newspaper guy? Hearst. Yeah, yeah. So the Bill Gates of his day, mm-hmm. his daughter gets kidnapped mm-hmm. and then Grand ends up really. But yeah. And I'm going to use the term ends up getting brainwashed mm-hmm. and becoming a bank robber for yeah. the people yeah. who kidnapped her. So. You're saying brainwash shouldn't be used in it that doesn't situation? Exist. It's not a psychological concept. There is something um, called coerced reasoning, whereby... And this well, is, there's the Stockholm Syndrome, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Isn't that a, just another word for brainwashing? Yeah, yeah, but again, it's casual, right? It's, it's not one that really has good grounding in, in academic literature. Um, Patty Hearst, if you dig into that case, what you'll find is that she was fairly alienated and didn't like her family at all um, and appears to have, you know, she, certainly, right, she was um, she was held in the closet for a long, long time, this sort of thing. But she comes to, I think, believe in what her kidnappers were telling her. And what her kidnappers were telling her was essentially like the Western capitalist world is corrupt and you should join us because we are utopian idealists who are going to build something better. Um, now... Right? Um, is that brainwashing, or is she kind of predisposed to accept some of these things? Um, which she tells people later she was, um, right? That she bought into it. Um, she was not reprogrammed, I think, because that's just not something you can do to the human mind. Well, um, even even Elizabeth Smart, let's take it. Mm-hmm. Let's take her. I mean, she's like the poster child of Stockholm syndrome. She, she gets kidnapped. She's got a loving family. Mm-hmm. And then the Brian David Mitchell is yeah. such a terrible person, basically coerces her into, and if you say anything, I'm going to kill your whole family. And that's it, right? That's coerced reasoning, right? It's okay. cruel. And if you ask her, I mean, you know, I, maybe you have, I don't know, but if you look at her books, I need right, to get her on. Elizabeth what, what, Smart, will you what, come on? What, what she will tell you is she was terrified. Yeah. Right? And that's, I mean, that's not being persuaded necessarily that's being coerced okay um, brainwashing you know as it's commonly used means something distinct from that all this is to say though right um and i'm and this is not my phrase i'm borrowing from hugh urban who wrote about scientology here what he will say is the term we should use here is abusive religion okay which is absolutely a thing right that's what jim jim jones was abusing people you, um, but we shouldn't pretend. I mean, you know, there, there are there are terrible, terrible sex abuse cases in the Roman Catholic Church and many other mainline denominations, um, including the LDS Church, right? Um, but we shouldn't pretend as though there's a special category of organizations that we can call cults that are all like this and that are inherently bad. And that's the problem, right? If you say a cult is an organization that has a charismatic leader um, that takes it, you know, that, that may separate you from your family, that puts you in a special place, separates you from modern society, you wear interesting clothing. Um, if that's a cult, and therefore things that do that are always bad and abusive, then what you have just done is told me that the Amish are a cult. <laughs> right? While... The Protestants would probably well, argue that, though. Some do. They? The yeah. evangelicals do, yes. Yeah. But while, at the same time, while such an organization that is so integrated into American life and is so normalized that a majority of our Supreme Court justices and our president are members of it, the Roman Catholic Church, is not a cult, even though the Roman Catholic Church has, has had a sex abuse problem. Mm-hmm. Right? And so the, 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 the lines, the distinctions that that phrase cult try to build, just fall down if you okay. push on them a little bit. Now, this isn't to say, right, and, and I think what, when, I, when I make this argument, what many people think I'm doing is saying um, religions are good and all religions are good. And, and it, when I tell them you can't call this religion a cult, they, they seem to think I'm defending Jim Jones and People's Temple, right. right? which I'm not doing. Right. right. I'm simply saying this category that you've invented of cult um, just doesn't work. It falls over. Now, if you want to say, right, that Scientology is an abusive religion, 
or that people's temple became an abusive religion. Absolutely, right? They were well, doing and there are going to be people that say Mormonism is abusive mm -hmm. towards women, towards gays. Yeah. I mean, well, you can say the same thing sure. about Catholicism, and yeah, you can say absolutely. the thing about evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. They have their own sex yeah. scandals. Yeah, I, I think you know fundamentally the argument I'm making here is that, is that the term cult is deeply rooted in evangelical theology and early you know early 20th century racism, um, and it, it and it's not useful because it draws such clear delineations that don't actually map onto the real world. Hmm. Right there, there are spectrums of these things. Right, some something like some I mean, something like People's Temple. Right, the, the the faction of People's Temple that eventually moved to Guyana and built Jonestown there and and died by suicide there. You know, what they are doing um, is maybe on one end of this, but there's a wide range of institutions and religious institutions that have many kind of dysfunctions and problems that flow from that spectrum. They're not, you cannot say the Catholic Church is just like People's Temple at Jonestown because it's not, but that's not to say it doesn't have problems. Right. You know? Um, so that's why I think cult is just a deeply problematic term and we should stop using it. Okay. So <laughs> I, I had a conversation with another uh, more well-known podcaster than me about this exact subject. <laughs> His response was, well, what do you want me to call it, a high-demand religion? Is, is that just as problematic or? I mean, so high-demand religion is a term that some sociologists have used yeah. in the past. Well, and um, in this case, it seemed like it was just a euphemism for a cult. Like, you don't want me to say cult, okay, right. I'm going to call it a high-demand well, religion. Well, the problem there, right, is, is to say high-demand in relative to what? So, like, is, is say, if you are a Zen Buddhist, and you live in Nepal in a monastery, uh, but everybody you know also lives in the monastery and does all the same things you do, are you in a high-demand religion? Um, or does Zen, or does like being a, a Zen Buddhist monk in Chicago, Illinois, does it become high-demand when it's there? Right? I mean, the high-demand is, is it, it's a little bit more useful, but it also has that problem of cultural relativity. It, it, the implication is that there's one scale of low demand versus high demand that's universally applicable to everyone everywhere. And human societies are such that that's just not the case. And I think one of the issues, right, as I mentioned before, is that here in the United States, um, because the United States is such a deeply Protestant country, we have it deep in our bones. Even people who don't, who will say I'm non-religious in the U.S. are basically Protestants. We assume that real religion, religion should look like Protestantism, which is to say it's built out of different denominations. There's a bunch of them. They all compete with each other. You choose to join the one that you believe in. Similarly, belief is the basic building block of religion. If you believe in a religion, then you do the different things that religion asks you to do. However, as Reynolds v. United States, the Supreme Court case, right, in which the Supreme Court ruled that polygamy was not protected by the First Amendment, the Supreme Court says in that case, essentially, you are free to believe in polygamy, but you can't do it. And they rule that because they assume, because they were all Protestants, that belief is the basic thing that a religion should do. You can believe anything, right? Just don't do things that are contradictory to our social norms. That's a Protestant assumption. And when I say that Mormonism became Protestant, that's part of what I mean, is that Mormonism gave up a lot of its practices, like polygamy, like economic communalism, like theocracy, right? Because Protestants said, no, 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 you can't do that. Religion is about believing something. Um, and you will notice, after the LDS Church abandons polygamy, in the late 19th century, it becomes increasingly a religion about your a testimony and about the things you personally do, the discipline you personally have, not like radical new social organizations, right? Um, but only like, I will follow the word of wisdom. I will pray every day, right? This kind of private devotionalism, which is also Protestantism. So when I say, right, what is a high-demand religion? In the United States, that's usually, again, like cult, used to mean a religion that is not Protestant. <laughs> it's a religion that makes you wear funny clothes, right? But in many other societies in the world, 
I mean, going back, you know, thousands of years, right? And even for a long time in China in the mid 20th century, everyone wore the same clothes. But we think that's weird in America because we don't think that's a religion you're supposed to, you're, I think a religion is supposed to do, largely because we're a capitalist society and we've kind of taught each other that you should buy clothes that you like. And we think like wearing clothes that you like is a fundamental of sort of human liberty or something. But that's more or less just what corporations have taught us. <laughs> um, we also kind of think, you know, high demand religion is a religion that makes you do things that most people in your society don't do. Like don't drink alcohol. Right? Americans are like, oh, that's really weird, right? I mean, everyone drinks alcohol. And therefore, being a high demand religion is, you know, it's essentially, right, a religion that makes you live in ways that aren't normal in the society in which you are. Um, and treating that, that normalcy as though it's some, some sort of like universal normal thing, and we should all want to be like that. You know, this is, it's, it's very interesting to me, right, that, that um, yeah, that, that um, leveling that as a critique against Mormonism essentially kind of buys in to the notion that the rest of American society is good and normal, and we should want to. We should all want to live like Taylor Swift, right? <laughs> and that's a, that's a deeply kind of capitalist idea, right? That the way that our, our heroes live and the way that other people live, we should want that too. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Matthew Bowman from Claremont Graduate University. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about why institutional churches are losing their influence over young people. What are the factors? Yeah. Um, I think, though, you're absolutely correct to say one of the great successes of the religious right in America is its kind of public relations, right. right? Its ability to kind of set up and say, this is Christianity. Christianity means you are against same-sex marriage. If you're not Christian or if you're, if you're not against same-sex marriage, you're not a Christian. Is right? that coming back and to bite them in the butt now because people are I like, oh, I got to leave my church because I, think, I yeah. disagree with that? I think that's exactly right. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, subscribe on either Patreon or at GospelTangents.com. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire audio uninterrupted. On our $10 tier, if you'd like to see the whole video, you can see that uh, either on YouTube.com slash GospelTangents, or I've got a special Facebook group devoted for uh, full videos. So subscribe at GospelTangents.com and uh, sign up for just $10 a month. For $20 a month, if you'd like to get some bonus content, uh, maybe some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, you can sign up for that. And then if you'd like to talk to me for $100 a month, we'll, we'll do a monthly phone call on something like Zoom, and you can ask me anything you want. So thanks again. Also, don't forget about the merch, mugs, t-shirts, um, hats, things like that. I'm trying to get the ties up there. Hopefully I can get up, up there. And uh, thanks again for watching Gospel Tangents and click here for some more videos.